Yoav was mentioning the Death Valley, the, the, the gap of funding, uh, of, which is a critical for many startups because you, you have a good idea, but then you need to scale it up. And that, that it's not so much money, but it's the right money at the right time that you need. Who do you think should put that money in? The government or the angel investors or? Yeah, I can tell you something. You have this problem also in the Silicon Valley today. Okay, so you have the, the Series A problem is the biggest problem all over the world. When I'm investing in a company, I'm saying, okay, most of the time when, when people are raising money from angels, they are saying, okay, I'm raising money No, and in six months, I will raise, I will raise a, a round. Most of the time, it take, it's taking 18 months. So what I'm saying to everyone is that today, to reach the Series A milestone, you need to have a lot, a lot more than an ID or concept or a product. You need to show that you have a product with a good market fit. You need to show that you, have, uh, uh, you know how to sell. And you need to show a ramp up. You need to show growth. So people in series, series A investors are not putting money to increase the growth, but are not putting money you know, to, to begin, to begin to this thing. Yes. And, and so, so I think this is the biggest mistake that many, many entrepreneurs, also in Israel, uh, most, I think mostly in Israel, because everyone thinks that it's so easy to raise money in Israel. And you can, I can tell you, I think this is one of the worst countries to raise a Series A here. Uh, uh, and uh, many people are saying, okay, I will spend a lot of money very, very fast, and I will be ready for the Series A. Series A is taking a lot of time. Uh, I don't think it can be sold. I don't think uh, a, a fund can come today and say, okay, Though I will invest in all, people, all startups looking for a Series A, because you have hundreds of them uh, turning here, you know, and, and they're high risk. Yeah. And they're uh, high risk. I it's mean. A, it's, it's, it's a, yeah, it's a high risk. It's a, you are putting a lot of money in that. My model is that I'm investing 150K dollars per startup. I'm investing in two to three startups a week. So my model is mathematical a little. I'm, I'm sad to say that. Also, if I have a big filter, I, I'm investing in only 1% of the company uh, that I'm receiving. And, but my model is saying, okay, I'm investing in 10, and we have one very success, one superstar in this one. And, and, and this, is, this is my model. And I think at this stage, and also at the Series A stage, I think I'm talking about the Series A with no real revenues, with no real growth, etc. I think that we have the, the exactly the same risk. Um, so you need to invest in a lot of projects. So if you want to, to, to invest, to launch a fund with, for Series A, you need to launch a, a, two, a $200 million fund, invest in 100 startups, 2 million each. It will be very difficult because you need to manage all of them. But I think this is the, 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 the only way to, to, to succeed. You, have, you want to comment on this? And, and yeah, then on, 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 on this note, uh, you were asking whether the government should pitch in or not. So, although people try to come to Israel to learn about government financing, actually, the level of financing in the EU, when you look at programs like Jeremy and so on, there's a 70% participation by the public sector versus 30% by, uh, uh, by the private one. So, actually, Europe is more advanced in this case. Uh, look, when it comes to funding from the Israeli government, the first thing I can say is pretty much forget it. Because when you look at the current budgetary situations, and we have to pay for education and housing and, and the conflict with our neighbors and so on and so forth. So everybody says high tech is most important, uh, but ultimately there's only so much uh, left. So what the government can do actually, and they've done it before, is to go for a non-fiscal approach, which is risk participation, which means it doesn't cost you out of pocket, but you provide um, uh, investors with either a safety net or a kicker where they get preferred returns at the end of the fund. That depends whether the investors are looking to maximize risk and return or to minimize uh, the risk. But these kind of programs, which very often are self-paying, can be a great boost to the kind of thing we're talking about here. Uh, we should have Mark. Uh, and then uh, I wanted to open, to open up the floor to comments because uh, uh, we've got to be out of here at uh, 10 to 3 because uh, we have another panel. So do you have Okay, we have, well, we have an agreement, finally. <laughs> okay. Um, Ifat, you want to add something on, on innovation because uh, an innovative funding model. So let's go for questions because, uh, I mean, we have uh, 
you have quite a selection of panelists here, and uh, I know that, uh, I don't know if you have taxi drivers here, but you sure have startuppers, so, and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> he didn't say that in the mic, but he's a soon-to-be taxi drivers, if you, if you don't come up with a funding scheme. <laughs> Okay, first question is uh, the ice is, uh, hardest one. We have mics. Please introduce yourself and. Hello, my name is Rem Sherman and I'm the co founder of a small startup named Happy Cell. We are um, right now in the around a valley, if you can say, halfway through. Gonna make it, I think. I want to ask all of you, but especially Fat. What is the bank view about this problem, about the round A? Because usually you hear about Lumi in the concept of Mobile AI and firms like this, or on the accelerator, which I know you do on the FinTech and everything else. What is your view about regular companies like most of us have? Do we want to gather one or two more questions so we have a uh, address? Well, you guys think up your questions, and you thought, okay. and so take this one. So I am right. Uh, I think I didn't explain myself right, so I cannot tell you the exact number, but we're working today with thousands of startups, so we are working with you know the middle stage one as opposed to very early or very late. What we're trying to do is to be able to, when we see a company after round A or round B, or it doesn't matter what round, to see beyond the numbers. So. You know, all those startups are in the room know that if you tell, if you give the the P and L or the financial statements to somebody who doesn't know the company, and you ask them, you know, what do you think about the company? A smart investor or a credit lender will say, I know nothing, because it's very tough to see from you know financial reports what's the situation of the company. And this is why we're adding another layer, where we look at the company in a very you know all the peripheral things around the company. For example. Who is the CEO? Who is the founder? Who do we know that knows the founder? Who invested in the company? Out of those investors, if there are any, what type of an investment did they make? Is this a very small investment compared to what they usually do? Or is it a very valid number, which we understand that they like the company and they'll probably save money for later on rounds? Or what type of, uh, you know, at what stage did the fund invest? Is it in the beginning of the fund life or the end of the fund life? What does the investor tell us about the company? We urge the companies to, tell, to bring to us the investors to give us comfort and tell us, you know, we like the company. We're not going to give the company all the money right now because we need to, you know, stage it. But we like it very much. It's in the top of our portfolio, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So what we're trying to do is to actually understand the company, understand the business, understand... Um, we, we, you know, the one thing that I think we have to remember is that we want to give credit to companies who can return the credit, okay? As opposed to equity, where we all know uh, that we invest and certain percentage of the companies will be okay. Very few percentage will be very, very big. And some of it will fail and we will lose completely the money. Now, you can imagine that if you look at the, the business model of a bank, we cannot afford to lose 40% of the credit loans because the bank will be bankrupt. So our methodologies are different and our analysis is different, but we're trying to be more understanding of things that are less, uh, no, you know, uh, less numbers and more uh, soft things about the company be, to be able to actually give the loan. Because just looking at the financial statements, it's very tough to give a loan. You all lose money for a very long time. You're going to continue to lose money because if you don't continue, you don't grow. So all the meth methods that we know from regular credit th don't apply. You have, you want to add something? Yeah, trying to help on the, you know, to bring the investor mentality on this. Uh, you know, there's a love-hate relationship between entrepreneurs and funds. And the way it works when you're on the fund and you raise your fund, you go to institutional investors, and if they receive you and if they give you coffee, they will ask if you're a first-time fund. Because if you're a first-time fund, they won't even give you the coffee. They'll tell you to go away. So it's a bit like Series A. So we ask them, how do you get to be a second time fund if you never have a first time fund? And they say, well, that's not our problem. So, so it's, it's pretty much the same here. So what are the kind of tips we have? So first of all, as you know, uh, when, when you go to funds, there are investment themes. 
you know, you, want, you, want, you might want to call it the soup of the day, but at the end of the day, it's easier to raise money for a cybersecurity company than for an energy saving company kind of thing. So one has to understand where the interested capital is there. If the team has people who've done it before, second time round, and by the way, Israel today has the biggest human pool in the world outside of the US of people who, who've already done that. And that's as, as much a national treasure as all of the magnesium in the Dead Sea. It's, it's a really big deal. Uh, so these people have more traction with uh, funds, but sometimes they go to people who've made money with them in the past. So going to people who have worked with you in the past usually doesn't give you all the money, but gets you to a level of some credibility that helps you raise the, the, the next amount. And then there's another thing, just to think a bit outside the box. In the past, venture capitalists would not, did not like to invest together with strategics because they said, I want to develop the company and then sell it to a strategic. I don't want the strategic knowing everything that's happening in, in my kitchen. Well, that is no longer the case. Uh, funds today are happy to invest with strategic and you have more and more companies, not just high-tech companies, not just Intel, IBM, Microsoft, but companies, you know, brick and mortar companies in anything from insurance to beverages to trucking who invest in high tech. So if a company finds a strategic participant or investor only to the tune of a million dollars, but invested who has some interest in the technology or what they do, or just wants to keep an eye on things, that sort of helps you start the whole process. Because ultimately, it, you know, it's like a train. It's hard to get it moving, but the minute it leaves, everybody wants to be on it. So you need to get that dynamic uh, going. Thank you. Have, we have uh, time for one last question. If, uh, can you pass the microphone over there to your colleague? Just be very brief, to, because we really need to be out of here in five minutes, in less than five minutes. I'm Oliver with uh, Solution Ventures. Um, what's your take on crowdfunding for equity sites in tier two markets? Like in markets like these sites, like there's lots of angel money, but I was just in Thailand and the government there sort of built a crowdfunding platform, homegrown. So, two questions. How can crowdfunding, from your perspective, help the lack of angel investment? And secondly, does it make sense to homegrow crowdfunding platforms or rather bring in a national sites and market those to the local investors? Okay, crowdfunding. For equity, not, not for grant. I'll just give an orthogonal answer, if I may. <clears throat> I think the Israel should follow the U.S. example and do a Jobs Act, which is not after Steve Jobs, in case you're wondering, and increase dramatically the number of um, investors in a company before it's considered a public company. And this will, of course, facilitate crowdfunding platforms and take in the second stage if there's a thousand or so participants, company size is large enough, you can start creating investment activities, trading activities, which will lead to these companies to grow and eventually they can be, become public and list. I'm not sure about the numbers, but I think there was probably the biggest push to um, the startup industry in the US in the last few years, the Jobs Act, and we should do exactly the same thing here. I think, I think that you have today the our crowd model in, in Israel, I think is the right one. Uh, because I think that you have too many startups in Israel, a lot, a lot of startups trying to raise money. And I think that if we are opening crowdfunding platform without involvement from the, from the partner of this, of this platform, so I, think, I mean that for today, our crowd, the partners are putting their own money in each startup they are funding, okay? And I think this is the most important thing. If we are seeing crowdfunding as, uh, uh, in, in, in the US, I think the mentality is a little different. I think that the, the, the concept of failure in the US is perhaps uh, uh, a little more important. I mean that funders are, are afraid to fail in the US more than in Israel. And if we want a crowdfunding platform to work in Israel, we can't solve this part because I don't think that Israeli funders fa are failing to fail. Uh, uh, are free to fail, but I think that we need to have a pre-approval, uh, a pre-validation by, by a certain group of angels or something like that. So I think that the best model is like the our crowd model or 
a model where you have a, a validation from a group of angels investing in a startup and syndicating after that uh, money from other type of investors. I think this is the right model. But the complex crowdfunding platform like in the UK and like in the in US, I think it could be too dangerous here because I think you have a lot, a lot of startups uh, with uh, very bad products, very bad companies, and, uh, and I think it can kill completely this model. So the crowd one is very good, I think. Uh, a comment on this. We, we need to make a differentiation between crowdfunding and angels. And very often the distinction would be that angels are people who know something about what the startup is doing, and are invest or at least believe they are, and that are investing in, in either people they know or a domain they know, and they know something about the customers, about the value chain. So that would be one differential. The other one is that angel investments are getting bigger and bigger. It used to be that the typical angel round was half a million dollars. Today we're seeing angel rounds of four or five million dollars. Uh, a company that we looked at recently raised from angel ten million dollars in its first round. Uh, so yeah, you have teams that can raise that kind of money. In, and, and, and these are people, again, who supposedly know something about the business or there are groups of people where one is the leader and everybody follows the, the leader. When it gets to uh, crowdfunding, I agree, you need somebody who serves as the buffer, and that's the management team, and the people there are pretty much investors. They like the story. I think a lot of the people who are doing crowdfunding in Israel like to be involved in the Israeli scene, uh, but let's not take it too far, and let's just hope people don't get to over, being overexposed in the, in the sense. Time's up. Yeah, I can add something. Very about brief. Yeah, very important. In the UK, about crowdfunding, I received uh, one month ago a company coming to me and say, I've just raised one million pounds in crowdfunding platform at a 20 million euro pound valuation. Now I need to raise more money. It will be for you to be for at four million. I think that we are seeing crowdfunding exploding all over the world, but I think we have to fear about that because we, have, we see a lot of failures. A lot of people will pay high valuations for, for, for committing nothing. So that kind of validation, as I've said, is the most important thing. That's all. Thanks. Thank you, everybody. Our time is up. Uh, uh, it's been a passionate, interesting, insightful. Thank you all to our panelists, and we'll leave the floor to make an amazing world. Thank you very much.